Hi. You guys, that was so good. Singing, that's not a talent of mine. I picture it in like the pre-earth life. I like, you stand in lines to get talents. And I feel like the singing talent was happening at the same time as like, I don't know, like a taco stand line or something. <laughs> that's where I was. <laughs> this is, <laughs> we're gonna have extra fun today. Uh, <laughs> mostly because I'm still heavily medicated from surgery. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's fine. <laughs> uh, I'm Al. Don't worry if you have no idea who I am, because you'll know more than you want to by the time I sit down, so it's fine. I'll tell you a little bit of how I got to be standing here in front of you right now. I am from New York. I met the missionaries right before I turned 21. I listened to them because I felt really bad for them because they were just really precious looking. <laughs> I didn't think, I don't know. When I first saw them, I'm like, who wears helmets still? I don't, I didn't know. Anyways, the way that I saw it was religion was something people turned to when something was going wrong in their life, as some sort of mental comfort or whatever. I don't know. And that wasn't me. You know, at age 20, I honestly thought I peaked in life, right? Surely things cannot get as good as they are right now with a, I had a studio apartment. It was the size of a single, like, bathroom but I loved my bathroom size apartment. And I worked full time at a hospital, nothing impressive. I did parking enforcement. <laughs> I gave people parking tickets at the hospital. No one liked me, it's fine. But I loved what I was doing and I loved who I was. I did, I loved who I was and I didn't want anything to change. But I felt so bad because they were dorky and I, I humored them. And so I wanted to prove to them, I wanted to show them like, hey, all these blessings you're working towards, they're all in your head. Sorry. And the only way that I could do that was to live exactly how they taught me to live, tried to, and to live it long enough to allow contrast to happen, if it were to happen. And then, and then show them like, see, Told you, nothing happened. And so this is my quest. I am out to live the gospel to prove the missionaries wrong. <laughs> Every day I would read the Book of Mormon. Every day. And what I would read about, I have no idea. Because it made no sense to me at first. But I did it because I told him I would. And every day I would pray. And I just know... <laughs> I know that they were the worst prayers Heavenly Father has ever heard, ever. I have never said a prayer before in my life. I've never prayed before, but I, I, I did it, and it was awkward. It was so incredibly awkward. I kind of felt like I was leaving in a voicemail. I don't know, just the idea of talking to yourself, like, that's weird. But I did it every day because I told them I would, and every day I would do these really awkward and uncomfortable efforts in quest to prove them wrong. And the funny thing about trying, and the funny thing about acting, is that we're blessed. No matter how awkward or, or terrible we think our efforts are, we are blessed by our efforts of trying. And one day I woke up at four in the morning, I couldn't sleep, and so I called my missionaries. I don't know what I was gonna say to them, I didn't think they'd answer, because it's four in the morning, and they did. And my first reaction was to just start screaming at them. And so I did, and I'm yelling, and I don't know what I'm yelling about, but it's really loud. And somewhere amongst all of my screaming, I yelled at them, and I said, I want to get baptized. I'm like, uh-uh. I didn't think that's what I was going to say. I didn't even know that that's what I wanted to do until I said, well, until I yelled it. And when I yelled it, oh, I felt it. I felt it. And I got so embarrassed, I just hung up the phone on them. <laughs> Can we just imagine this for a second? Four more, hey, baptism click, like what on earth? <laughs> Now this decision, it came out of nowhere. It came out of nowhere that not only did it surprise me, it surprised my missionaries. That they called me right back. And they were more confused than they were excited. <laughs> they called me back and they were like, what? Why? 
what happened? So I decided to get baptized and that was wild. That was wild to me because even though I knew that this was true, even though I could feel that this is right, I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. So embarrassed and ashamed to be part of anything to do with this church. So embarrassed that I didn't invite a single person to my baptism. Well, I invited one person. His name was Scott. And at the time, I didn't know who Scott was, so it was awkward. He, he was dating one of my sisters at the time, but I've never met him before. I never spoke to him to before. And I called him up and I said, hey, kind of getting baptized. He said, can I come? And I said, I think that's why I called you. <laughs> the day of my baptism, having not invited anyone, you know, except whomever Scott is, the room is packed. So many people were there that they can all fit. They were flooded out into the hallways, and that meant the world to me. Just by them being there was a testimony to me that what I was doing was right. And so I got baptized. And, and that was neat. I liked it. I, it was fine. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes you hear stories of people coming on the font and they're yelling or crying or whatever. And that wasn't me. I was happy because I knew what I'd done, but, but mostly wet. <laughs> and like really cold. But when I got confirmed, oh, this was my favorite part. Oh, I love I loved this part. Because, you know, when I got that gift, I physically felt, I physically felt myself get that gift. The contrast is huge. The difference is real. And in that exact second, I was not embarrassed anymore. I was not ashamed in any degree. And I wanted to yell to, to all of New York like, happiness is real. It's real and exists and you can have it. I have these boys with doofy helmets, we'll talk to you. <laughs> I realized that I had the answers to the questions of the universe. Whoa. Some people go their entire life seeking after what we know and sometimes not ever finding it. And so when you have something that you love, when you have something that just makes you feel good, you wanna share it, right? And so I turned to my friends and I feel like I had a lot of friends I did, I had a lot of friends, friends that I loved and trusted and would tell everything to, and, and not one of them, not one of them stayed. They all left. They wanted nothing to do with me and, and what I was a part of, and it hurt. It hurt to see how easy it was for them to leave and how quickly they did. And so then I turned to my family, and I love my, my family super. I love my, my parents. Oh, my parents have been separated for, I don't know, as long as I can remember. And my dad, oh, I love my dad. I love my dad. We are the closest you could ever imagine. And at the time, I lived just a few blocks away from where he lived. And every day, without fail, I'd walk to my dad's house, and I'd make him lunch every day. I was the only one out of my siblings that would tell him everything. You know, I'd tell him about uh, boys, and he hated it. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved that he hated it because I thought it was funny. And every year for our birthday, he takes us out to birthday brunch. It is my 21st birthday. And my dad, my best friend and biggest support, he looks me right in the eye and he says, Al, I don't want you as a daughter anymore. I don't want you as a daughter anymore. You have to pick this, uh, this church that you just found out, you know, a few weeks ago. And how small, how small my knowledge was at the time. Out of everything there is to know about the gospel, the only thing I knew at that time was that the Book of Mormon was true. That's it. I didn't even read it all the way through. I don't think I made it past a few chapters until I knew it made everything true. And, and that's not naive of me. That's what the Spirit does. He said, you know, this, this church, or me, your dad. And I remember thinking, what a, what an easy decision for a difficult situation, right? I already chose who I wanted to follow, didn't I? That 
is what happens when we get baptized. I already recognized that this happiness that I didn't even know existed, that it does, and it only comes from the gospel. I knew that I could feel that. I knew that because I went 21 years of my life thinking and, and, and seeing if it came from somewhere else, and it doesn't. It does not. So I decided right then and there, and I said, Dad, I'm sorry. I love you. He really kept his word. I'd walk to his house still. He'd lock the door. He'd close the blinds. I'd call. He would never pick up my my calls. He would never return my voicemails. And I went to work, right, parking enforcement, and I looked like the fake cop. I had these badges that meant nothing and this dress up with with I wore a tie, and I had these men's suit pants, which were the most unflattering pair of pants a girl could ever want to put on. They were huge. So what I would do, I would hide the Book of Mormon in the front of my pants. (laughs) And you couldn't tell it was there. That's how big they were. (laughs) Not often, but several times, all of my coworkers and all of my bosses, I had a few of them, they would all get together and they would lock me in an office. They would lock me in an office just to scream at me. And they would say, you, not a good person. What you are doing, what you are part of is wrong. And they made me watch these terrible, terrible and untrue videos about the church and how hard it was. I didn't know how to defend the church. I didn't even know how to defend myself, right? The only thing I knew was that those few chapters made everything true and how hard it was to see everyone that I loved so much either scream at me or just leave. Gone. I felt like I was being punished for doing what I thought was the right thing. Every time things got hard, every second that I had free, I would, I would pull the Book of Mormon out of my pants, <laughs> and I would read it every chance I could. I would fake bathroom breaks just to read scriptures. And not once did my situation change because of it. Mm, not really. But... Every single time I was given the strength and the knowledge to be able to handle what I was going through, right? That book, that is where strength comes from. I don't know what I'd do without that book. And so what do you do when you just turn 21 and you live in downtown Rochester, New York with a nightlife very active right outside your door and you don't have any friends? Well, I'll tell you what you do. I don't know how many of you have been home on a Friday or Saturday night by yourself, and you have these fleeting thoughts of, I feel lame. (laughs) Maybe not. Maybe that was just me. That's how I felt. Because every Friday and Saturday night for months, these were long months, what I would do every Friday and Saturday night is I would make up church talks for fun. (laughs) I get it. It's wild. You guys aren't even laughing. You're like, that's too wild to laugh at. (laughs) What I would do during the day, because I worked, uh, you know, I worked the evening shift. Every single day I would go out with the missionaries and help uh, help them teach investigators and last actives. And I remember thinking, yes, like Heavenly Father, I want to go on a mission. What do you think? And I knew my answer was going to be yes. I, I knew it. Because that is a righteous, good thing to want to do. Why be denied a good thing, right? And do you know what my answer was? <laughs> Move to Utah. Uh, it's not what I asked for. <laughs> Thanks, though. <laughs> I didn't want to move to Utah. I honestly completely forgot Utah was even a state until I met all these missionaries. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe, maybe if I asked differently, if I like reworded my prayer, I would get a different answer. <laughs> uh, not the case. No, I thought maybe, maybe if I told them how much it would mean so much to me. It was so important that he'll allow for it to happen. And that was not the case. Now, my answer came as a reoccurring thought. 
a reoccurring thought I figured if I ignored long enough, it would go away. No. <laughs> weeks and weeks, and it kept coming back, and finally what it came down to was, wow, I just found out that God is real. He's real. He, in reality, speaks to us, and who would I be if I said, hey, God, you're wrong. I can't say that. That's God. Who am I to say that to him? And how guilty I would have felt if I finally got an answer, and I didn't do anything about it. The guilt would have killed me. So I was like, hey, fine. I'll go to Utah. And it was hard. It was hard. I just wanted someone to support me. And everyone at church, you know, I didn't see other members during the week. I drove, people drove up to two hours to get to church. And I just thought, you know, they understood the, the spirit. Surely someone there will be like, Al, great. Let me know if you need help with anything. Or Al, that's interesting. I even would have accepted that. But they all said the same thing, including my branch president. He says, Al, don't go to Utah. <laughs> don't do it. If you move there, no one will like you. Al, if you move there, you won't fit in. Don't do it, Al. Don't go. And I remember thinking, uh, well, so, well, don't tell me that because I gotta I got go still. He's making me. <laughs> <laughs> and how hard it was to feel like I was doing it absolutely and completely alone. Me trying to find a place in Utah is a whole nother story that we just won't have time for. So I'll cut to the chase of getting down two days before I'm supposed to move. Someone's moving into my apartment. I quit my job already and nothing has worked out. If it doesn't work out for whatever reason, I'll be very broke and very homeless. You can imagine how nervous I am, right? And I am mad. I am. I'm mad. I am so mad at God because every day I am trying and I feel like I have nothing to show for my efforts. And I am mad and I'm mad and I, I start yelling at God and I said, I don't know what else to do. I don't know what else to do. I am uh, praying, I'm reading, I'm fasting. I don't know how many times I have nothing to show for it. Why? Why is something so right? so hard. Do you care still about me? Are you even there at all? Right? And to plead for an answer just to know why I have to move. And he didn't answer me that. And it was hard because, you know, when my dad found out, it was the first time I heard from him in a really long time. And he says, Al, why are you leaving me? Why are you moving all the way across the country to a place you had never been, where you don't know a single person? Why? And what was I supposed to say? My dad, he's not a religious man. Well, I can't be like, hey, dad, God told me to, so it's fine. He wouldn't have understood that and how hard it was to see him so confused and, and hurt and, and offended and worried. I did not have the answer to give him any comfort and to me, not have that comfort for me. And I was so scared, I forgot how to turn my car on. I'm so scared. I can't turn my key. And I didn't even know if I'm supposed to take a right or a left on my driveway. And I drove all the way to Utah Valley, Utah. I didn't stop once. I couldn't. I knew that if I stopped, doubt, temptation, will start to seep in. I knew that if I even took a break, I would end up in a direction Heavenly Father does not want me to go in. Literally at the time, back home to New York, but, but spiritually, I think there's also a lesson there. I didn't stop to eat. I didn't even get drive through food. That's how much I didn't stop, right? And I fit my entire life into a two-door Alero Oldsmobile, which isn't much of a life. If you think of a two-door car made in the 1990s, I don't even think they make two-door cars anymore. But I was so excited to get here because of how hard it was. Because this is where he wanted me, this is what he wanted me to do. And you know, here I am, I just left behind the only way of living that I know of. New York, very different than Utah. <laughs> And I left, and I have to cope with the idea that I could never see my dad ever again. 
And I drove across the country, and luckily something worked out for me to live as I'm driving here. Talk about gray hair. I think that is textbook definition of 11th hour blessing. And you know, this is it. Here I am. This is my new home. This is where God has brought me. And I was so excited. I knew that because this was all God's workings and makings, that this is where things will start to get better and easier and start to make sense. You know, this is it. I'm looking at my new home and the grass is up past my hips. It was really tall. <laughs> it was really dead. <laughs> There's all these like broken toys and rusted treasures braided into the grass that have been there for, I don't know how long. I don't know. And I don't know where they came from, but there was three, maybe four kids running around my backyard with zero clothes on. <laughs> Couldn't tell you either. <laughs> I don't know what it was at this point. I'm so grateful I don't know what it was because something smelled so bad. And I just said to him, I said to God, this is where you brought me? With the naked kids and the smell? Neat, hear me out. I meant to bring my blankets, I did. But they somehow didn't make it into my car. It would be a very long time before I'd get a job out here, and an even longer time to get paid for that job. Eventually, <laughs> uh, when I eventually got a job and eventually got paid for that job, driving by a Target, that was a really good day for me. But it wouldn't happen for a while, and so here I am, across the country, lying on the floor, wrapped in a towel. This is where my new faith has brought me. And I went in my very first day in Utah, I went to Cafe Rio. We don't have those back home. I was very excited. I'm standing right in the middle of everyone, holding a church book just like this. It's a biography on, I don't know, one of the prophets. You know you can tell when someone just staring at you? It feels like lasers. That's how I felt, except the lasers were every direction. I remember feeling really tense, and finally the guy, he gets my attention, the guy next to me, and he goes, pretty ironic looking the way you do holding that book. My heart broke. Immediately I thought of everyone back home saying, Al, don't go. No one will like you, and you will not fit in. How badly, I didn't, how badly I wanted to, I wanted to turn to him, and I wanted to scream at him and just say, do you know what I just went through? Do you know how hard this is? Do you know what and who I had to give up to be here and I didn't even know why? And guys my age, our age, our age. I'm not old, you guys, I swear. They're looking for temple-worthy girls and that is a great goal. But I don't exactly look temple-worthy that not only did no one wanted to date me. They didn't even speak to me. And not just guys our age, no one, despite my best efforts, other than that man in Cafe Rio, spoke to me for a long time. And I think these feelings, just as human beings, really stink. But I think especially as women, to feel unnoticed, unwanted, damaged, indescribable, and to then plead for an answer just to know why he wanted me to do all this and not get one, and to just go home and lay on the floor and wrap myself in a towel. And I just relate too much to Laman and Lemuel. And in Laman and Lemuel, it's in 1 Nephi chapter 17. This is when they've been in the wilderness for a really long time. And I think we're all familiar that they went into the wilderness because they were told that Jerusalem was supposed to be destroyed. At this point, Jerusalem hadn't been destroyed yet. And Laman and Lemuel are talking and he says, Thou art like unto our father, led away by the foolish imaginations of his heart. Yea, he hath led us out of the land of Jerusalem, and we have wandered in the wilderness for these many years. And our women have toiled, being big with child. And they have borne children in the wilderness and suffered all things, save it were death. It would have been better that they had died. 
before they came out of Jerusalem than to have suffered these afflictions. Behold, these many years we have suffered in the wilderness, which time we might have enjoyed our profession, possessions and the land of our inheritance. Yea, we might have been happy. They're mad. They're mad. They're mad that they had to leave everything. They're mad that they have to live a life different than everyone else. And for what? Destruction that didn't even happen yet? And so I know that we have these moments that lead us lying on the floor, screaming at him, wondering why, for what? Blessings that haven't even happened yet? But no pathetic attempt from the adversary can take away from the reality of what I felt when I got that gift. I refuse to let some pathetic attempt from the adversary take away from the times where I did temple work for all of my grandparents. And I refused to let some pathetic attempt from the adversary take away from what I am feeling right now. I refuse to let some hardship take away from the reality where I have felt my soul dancing within me. To forget or doubt those times, those goosebump moments, those heart throbbing moments, and I cannot deny that every time I have felt those soul dancing and goosebump moments, I have been living the gospel. Yeah, hard times will consistently be there. That won't change. I've spent many, many times yelling at God. Hard times will always be there, but, but so will Christ. And with him, do we overcome and conquer absolutely everything. With him, we can overcome and conquer every feeling of loneliness or doubt or an agency or, or temptation or confusion. With him, we can overcome and conquer uh, the world, right? And I love that. If we think Heavenly Father will do anything to stop us from overcoming and conquering, we're wrong. If we think Heavenly Father will do anything to stop us from being happy right now, today, even in our trials, we're wrong. Comfort is always there because Christ is always there. And he can be felt in the darkest and most confusing of times if we just turn to him. And if we just choose to trust. Choose to have faith. To embrace the unexpected, knowing who is guiding us. Not once has things gone the way that I had in mind. Not once. And that could be hard, especially if you think it's a righteous, good thing that you're asking for, especially if it means so much to you. How many times, you know, it's then, it's then where we have those fleeting thoughts and we wonder where he is and if he really cares about me, right? But how grateful, how grateful I am that they did not go the way that I had in mind because they have been profoundly better than what I ever could have imagined for myself, greater than I even knew existed. All of the promises, all of the blessings that we're trying so hard to attain, in scripture, they're all written in past tense, right? Prepared. They're already there. Heavenly Father, he has already spent the time, the love, the work, and the effort into preparing the absolute best ever created, and you can have it if you just keep going. And if you just try, and if you choose him, I don't care how many times a day. And I love that. This is real. And I wouldn't have a single thing I have now, if it weren't for those exact moments, I was screaming at him, wondering where he was. It was every single moment I was wondering where he was that brought me to everything I have now. And it breaks my heart to imagine my life any different. Embrace the unexpected, knowing who is guiding you. 
Because if having the most powerful, all-knowing being to ever exist on your side isn't empowering, I don't know what is. Alma 56, 36, it says, Behold, our God is with us, and he will not suffer that we should fall. Then let us go forth. And I want to echo that. Go forth. Fear not. Forget not whose hands you're in. Forget not that we have the answers to the questions of the universe. And as we all know, Jerusalem was destroyed. No matter the time frame, do not let doubts or questions, do not let passing time dictate his promises and revelation given to us. Jerusalem was destroyed and, and promises were fulfilled and revelation was fulfilled, just like for us too, will be fulfilled. Because the reality is, he is real. He's as real as our heart beating right now. In this exact second, God is mindful of you. And the second after that, and all the seconds after that, refuse to let some pathetic attempt from the adversary dim that. Your prayers have been heard, but greater is what he has in store for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, my best friend, amen. <laughs>